Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Hong Kong Foreign Correspondence Club. My name is Hanna Mina Tanninen, and I am the club's vice president, one of two. And uh, as my profession, I work as the Hong Kong correspondent for the leading Finnish financial newspaper, Kaupalehti. Um, those of you, uh, we are very, very happy to see all of you here today, and hopefully some people online as well. Those of you who are here for the first time, Hong Kong Foreign Correspondence Club is a private club which, a, which has a very diverse member base from journalists to um, financial professionals to lawyers to artists. We've been residing here at this grade A historic building for past 40 years and we put a lot of time, money and love to maintain this building. We organize a lot of events, um, which I'm going to tell you a bit more later, um, but you can learn more about the FCC, how to join a member, and our future events on our website or on our social media, where the handle is usually at FCC. Before um, we go to the main topic of the day <laughs> with our uh, brilliant book writer, uh, let me tell you more about a couple of the upcoming events. We, have, we will have on Monday, June 27th, a a uh, movie screening, No Ordinary Life, a documentary about five pioneering war cameramen at CNN. Uh, with the film screening, there will be a buffet with free flow beverage, and the screening starts at 7 p.m. We still have few spots left. I highly recommend you to go to that. Um, on June 29th, we will have a Zoom event, because, you know, <laughs> then that's what we do on these days as well. We will have um, Weather, Democracy and Hong Kong, a civilizational state perspective, where we will have our guest speaker will be Chang Weiwei, director of the China Institute at Fudan University. Um, the um, sign-ups for those ones are open as well. Um, and then we will have a quiz night on the 30th, but that might be full, but that's the second round of this year's quiz. And, but going to the agenda of the day, we will have our distinct speaker today is James Falk. And before <laughs> I will finally ask you the first question after my monologue, uh, let me introduce you our speaker. Uh, James is a veteran financial and strategic advisor to corporations and governments. He served as a senior executive at Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing from 2012 until 2021, during a period of rapid, rapid internationalization in China's capital markets. While, while there, he played a major role in a number of landmark global financial market initiatives, including the launch of stock and bond connect programs between Hong Kong and mainland China. Prior to uh, Hong Kong Exchange, Fock worked as investment banker in both Europe and Asia, specializing in the financial services sector. Hock has written and spoken extensively about market structure issues and the intersection between geopolitics, international finance, and, ser and serves or has served on a number of international financial industry bodies. So once again, welcome and, and thank you for joining us today. Well, th thank you, Hanamina, for that very kind introduction. Um, thank you very much to the FCC for hosting this, and thank you to you all for coming to join. Okay. Um, as a um, fellow book author myself, I know that it is very easy to find inspiration to write a book. So I'm not going to ask you what inspired, to, what, what, what inspired to write the book, but I ask you, what was the message? What were the main messages that were strong enough that you wanted it to go through the hardship of writing and finishing a book? Um, well, my, my motivation for writing the book. Um, well, look, in 2020, my family and I, like countless other families around the world, we found ourselves in lockdown together, and my, my wife and I happened to have twin boys who were age four then. I, I love my kids, but um, <laughs> the, just the, being able to get away for a few hours a day just to focus on a, a little writing project uh, seemed to be something good for my sanity, and my wife strongly encouraged it. So that, that was the, the sort of backdrop. But more, more seriously, the we we just in Hong Kong at that time been through the massive trauma 
of the 2019 protests. And we, we had this creeping escalation of conflict between China and the United States. And like many people, I was just scratching my head trying to understand what had gone on. And I wanted to try and explain to myself as much as anything else what, what were the factors that led up to it. And what I realized was that everything I'd been doing over the decade previously, which was mainly around helping negotiate the internationalization of China's capital markets with policymakers and regulators in mainland China, in Hong Kong, and around the world, I had developed certain insights which I thought were helpful in trying to understand the issues that had brought us to where we are. And I, I wrote it very much in the hope that with a better understanding of how we'd gotten here, policymakers on both sides in the United States and China might find it easier to find resolutions to the problems. Okay, um, your book, uh, Financial Cold War, which will be um, sold uh, after the event, and I'm, I'm hoping that you will stay with us and, and sign a couple of, of books after the event, um, which is, uh, and the book is, by the way, also um, on the Financial Times summer reading list. Co congratulations. Thank you. There, you, um, you know, obviously the whole book is, is about the US-China relationship. Um, but then book is always a printed material. And then the book came out before, for example, Ukraine war. Um, there is a big NATO summit next week where um, a lot of Asian countries are participating and, and many uh, Asian countries have said that China is one of the biggest reasons why they will join. So considering all that, how do you see the US-China relationship at the moment? And what are the key points to um, you know, basically have led us to this situation? I think that we're at quite a dangerous juncture in relations between China and the United States. And I think actually one of the major drivers for that is actually domestic issues facing the two countries individually. Many of the underlying problems, and we've seen this throughout history, these are some of the circumstances are entirely new, but the, the cycles tend to repeat. And wh whenever you have a, an extreme concentration in wealth and income arising, what you've seen is you've tended to see conflicts arise, both within countries and between countries. And I think in, in, very much, in, in a very big sense, actually, what's happened uh, driven by many of the structures and of the financial system and policies which national governments have chosen to pursue. We, we've created this situation for ourselves, and it, it's going to be very difficult to extricate ourselves from it. But when you ask about Ukraine, how that has specifically affected the relationship, uh, I think that the, the Ukrainian situation's changed certain things and it will accelerate a, a number of trends. And particularly first, very clearly, the unprecedented level of sanctions that have been leveled at Russia as a result of what, what's happened in Ukraine has turned the concept or the theoretical risk of China having its foreign exchange reserves, which are very large, frozen from a theoretical risk into a realistic and imminent possibility. It's also galvanized the, the West, Western Europe and, and the United States and, and many others around the world in a way that would have been very difficult to imagine some months ago. And th there are positive aspects to that. But for, from China's point of view, it also elevates the risk 
of a strategic rival finding pretext to contain it through financial means. And so in terms of the acceleration of trends, China has been gradually internationalizing its markets, has been gradually trying to reduce the dependence that it's got on the US dollar and the dollar system. But every step that it's taken so far has really been a baby step. I mean, the idea that you know, SIPs is going to be a realistic alternative to SWIFT, frankly, is, is, not, is not particularly realistic. And the, the fact is that the only way for China to truly reduce its dependence on the dollar will be to internationalize the renminbi. And the only way that it can do that really effectively and in a timely way is to foster the creation of an offshore renminbi ecosystem. And the, the people who've got the renminbi to invest are the Chinese. They have a large surplus of savings. And there are actually too few opportunities for them to invest in the domestic market, which is why you've seen bubbles arising in various markets, and in particular residential real estate. And so China will now inevitably have to think very hard about making a much more significant step around the internationalization of the renminbi. That, that's, of course, not its first choice. If it were entirely up to the Chinese, they would not internationalize the renminbi that way. They would far rather see a neutral international unit like the IMF special drawing rights come in and step into that role that the US dollar has played. They, they, they prefer that because they've looked at the enormous costs of maintaining the dollar system to the United States itself, and they realized that they, they don't, do not particularly want to start absorbing the financial imbalances of the rest of the world. But in the absence of an environment in which you can cooperate to create a viable alternative, I think China will now have to make some significant steps. And in fact, you know, many people will look at renminbi internationalization with some degree of trepidation and as some challenge to the US dollar system. But the reality is that actually we should all, including the United States, welcome this because actually China taking those steps will help to address many of the major imbalances that have arisen in the global financial system which have contributed to many of the problems that we've got. And one of the reasons why China wants to keep its currency less international uh, goes to the kind of the basic economic theories where you can only control one thing of, of the trilemma, which is uh, interest rates or, 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 the, or the capital, whether it's international Thanks, or not. Thanks. And if it, yes, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> uh, the um, but then, are you afraid that if? Or like, what would be the repercussions if China did internationalize the, the, their currency? Would there be a capital flight? Would there be higher interest rates? Because in, in, in theory, that's not possible to have all three of those. Although during COVID, I don't think any of the economic theories have hold. Well, for, first of all, you're, you're absolutely right that China allowing the renminbi to internationalize will inevitably mean giving up some level of control that the Chinese government has over its domestic economy today. And many, many governments haven't wanted to do that. Many governments haven't wanted to do that. But the reality is that China, as the second largest economy in the world, is much better equipped in many ways than smaller countries to allow that to happen. Certainly, it would be very difficult for Hong Kong or a small financial center like Singapore to be completely sort of untethered and have a free-floating currency. But China has the ability to do that. And so, in a sense, for the Chinese, the, really, the question really comes about the path to doing so. You're right that having had a 
it's not entirely closed capital account, to be honest. It's a semi-closed or semi-open, depending on, on whether you're a glass half empty or half full sort of a person now. But the, the fact is that they, they will have to find a way of allowing that to happen in, in a way that doesn't create a huge amount of imbalances just in the process, because there is pent-up demand within China to go out and invest overseas, buy assets overseas. We've seen that phenomenon in the Vancouver property market, in the Sydney property market, Melbourne, and around the world. The, the, we, we saw in 2007 with the, with, with the through train scheme that never went through, that even just the announcement that Chinese capital would be allowed to enter into a certain market led to a huge run-up in the Hang Seng Index. And then once it became apparent that that wasn't going to happen, then the index crashed. Having learned those lessons, Chinese policymakers will have to find ways of controlling that capital outflow for a time as it starts going out into other markets. That's desirable also for the recipient markets because you don't want to have suddenly a huge flood of capital coming in and creating huge bubbles that then burst with, with social consequences for yourself. So th there, are, there are conversations underway uh, around how China can do this. And I, I believe that actually that there's some very sensible ways in which they can do that. And, and in fact, way, ways in which Hong Kong may end up playing quite a big role in the process. But giving up control of capital or the currency also means having less control over the economy. Um, but then once the China's economic growth, at least for the rest of the year, doesn't seem very uh, positive at the moment, usually countries, usually when the economies go down, countries tend to become even more strict and, and more controlling over what happens in the, in the economy. Do you think China would be happy, well, obviously not happy, uh, but China would be ready to give up some of the political control over the economy to internationalize the currency? Well, I wouldn't focus too much on the, the immediate current year because the, the, what we're talking about in terms of currency internationalization is a, is a really multi-year and, and perhaps even multi-decade process. It has been so far. And so the, the focus on the, the control of economic growth in any one year is, is not particularly pertinent to the overall question. But in terms of giving up control, I think that actually one of the one of the big benefits that China has had in coming from where it was over 40 years ago, from basically being dirt poor and you know, pretty much kind of at, at the bottom of its luck, um, to being a pretty prosperous and vibrant global economy, the second largest in the world today, has very much in large part been because the government has had control in the early stages of the process, because it's been able to use the control over the state-owned banking system to drive China's savings into infrastructure and other development priorities. You, you, you can't you can't negate the, the fact that this control has done an awful lot of good. But we are where we are now, and where we are now is that China is now a much more complex and sophisticated economy, which means that it basically defies the ability of any central planner to sit there and make capital allocation decisions for the entire economy. It's just too complicated and inevitably if someone tries to do it they'll get things wrong and, and big things wrong. So in, in that sense I think that China needs to let go 
and allow market forces to drive the allocation of capital to a greater degree than it has done in the past. Now, I'm not saying that it should necessarily follow the US path of complete sort of you know, free for all, free market economics, but uh, I think certainly it is in China's own self interest, given the stage of economic development that is at, for market forces to play a greater role which means that the government ceding some level of control over the economy. Okay. You have um, spoken against the sanctions, and you, you made a, a little mention about it um, earlier in, in this interview. Why are you against sanctions, and why do you see them as a critical thing? In conventional warfare, you have an established principle of non-combatant immunity. This is something that is impossible to impose on financial warfare. And so in, in the case of the sanctions on Russia that you've seen, that there's a whole bunch of first order effects which are very obvious. You had a short term run on the ruble, you had a spike in the oil price. But that there are also second order effects to that. The, the second order effect that I've spoken about before is that if you look at the unrest that you've had in Sri Lanka recently, that was precipitated by inflation, fuel price inflation, that is a result of the sanctions on Russia. Sri Lanka is an innocent bystander. It's not the... Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I was see, just going to comment it's, that it's, I, I it's think... It's an issue that's of... exacerba <laughs> it's exacerbated a pre previous problem, but it, it's nevertheless made the problem a lot worse than it was, okay? So, in many ways, you know, Sri Lanka has nothing to do with Ukraine, but it's been hit by these sanctions. And remember also that the, the butterfly effects of financial markets means that these, the, the ultimate impacts are very unpredictable. There will be third order effects to the, the sanctions and we, we don't know where those might crop up. But uh, I think you know, in, in employing those sanctions or employing financial sanctions generally, I think that many financial policymakers or many policymakers who bring them in haven't necessarily given thorough enough consideration to the, the second and th third order impacts and who might get hurt out of the sanctions other than just the targeted party. Um, coming from a country that shares over 2,000 kilometer border with, with Russia, it, it is uh, uh, very easy to see why putting sanctions would be necessary because once you put sanctions, at least you will make fin uh, funding the war that Russia very clearly started uh, much more difficult. And, and in some way, you, you kind of need to, it comes to a conversation between the, the kind of the war or the bystanders of the sanctions. So have it, looking at it from that perspective, um, it is, what do you feel, like, what are your comments to those who greatly support the sanctions? I think you have to, you have to ask the question in imposing the sanctions is that what are the effects that they're going to have? It hasn't actually cut off financing to, to Russia for its campaign in Ukraine at all, as far as I can see so far. And you know, in in terms of in in terms of what what the sanctions are aiming to achieve, I think there's some that hope that by pursuing these war by other means, whether it's through financial sanctions or through cyber means, that it will prevent a real war. It will prevent you know tanks rolling across borders, etc. I, I'm afraid that I'm not of that point of view. What, what I actually see is that sanctions uh, and cyber warfare uh, and other means of warfare are simply another stage in the ratcheting up of tensions. And they, they will not necessarily avoid you know, the ultimate catastrophe if that's where we're heading. 
if you if you want to avoid the chaos free, I think certainly in, in the in the situation of Ukraine, uh, I think that you know, and, and unfortunately it's water under the bridge now, and, and we, we can't dial back the clock. Uh, I think that much more careful consideration should have been given to the, the policies that were pursued in the months and years leading up to the unfortunate events that have occurred. Okay, and then um, I have one more question and then we'll take uh, uh, also questions uh, from the audience. Um, the word on the Wall Street, a little financial journalist humor there, um, is that the Chinese companies might be delisting from the US by the end of the year. Now it comes to whether one governing body gives enough information to another governing body, how the um, how the, like the conversations will go through. So my questions are, is this likely to happen, that the Chinese companies will delist from the US? And what kind of political and economical implications will it have? Well, well first of all, on, on timing, I, I don't think it's by the end of the year. The, the, the US, the, the relevant US Act, I think, gives the Chinese companies that are not compliant two years, which takes them through uh, until early 2024. But, um, you know, that, that's still only you know, a year and a half away now. So I think when you look at this issue and look at the incentives on both sides, I think, you know, that there is a risk in that that it's very clear that the U.S. government or, or parts of the U.S. government would prefer U.S. capital not to flow into Chinese companies. Now, in the context of the U.S. free market philosophy, it's very difficult for the government just to go and outright ban investment in Chinese companies. They can selectively do so on kind of sanctions pretexts or on you know, technology, security, and other types of pretext, but it's very difficult for them to outright ban it. So we, we've ended up with the situation where the disclosure of audit papers has become the, you know, a central issue in deciding this. Now, if you look on the, if you look on the face of it, that the US has had these rules in place since 2002 that US listed companies have to give the, the, uh, the PCAOB, um, the, account, the relevant accounting board, access to audit papers of US listed companies. And Chinese companies for a long time have failed to do so. If you look at it objectively, Chinese companies listed on the US on the knowledge and understanding that these rules existed. And so rightfully, they should comply with the rules or be delisted. Now, you, you can entirely understand also China's sensitivities because you know, the, the fact is that many Chinese companies, unlike many companies in the United States or, or other more free market economies, that there's a very big intertwining of state interests and private interests, and many of the listed companies are state-owned enterprises, and the way that Chinese companies, many of them organize themselves, they don't strictly divide you know, what is a national security issue versus you know, what's just an accounting issue. And so operationally, it's in some cases quite difficult for them to meet that standard. So there is a real risk that Chinese companies get delisted. The, the economic impact of that, or at least the impact on financial markets, could be very significant indeed. As of the end of the first quarter, there are around 260 Chinese companies listed in the US with listed market capitalization of something in the order of 1.4 trillion US dollars. Now, some of these companies have come and done secondary listings in Hong Kong and maybe able to come back, but the fact is that if those guys have to delist from the US market and many US or international investors that hold them have to sell the shares and those shares have to be absorbed into be it the Hong Kong market, the Shanghai market, the Shenzhen market, it is going to be a, an enormous amount of volatility, which is not 
particularly in, in the market's interest. It's not in China's economic interest. I, I don't think even it's in United States' interests, given that the markets are so intertwined now that will inevitably have re repercussions for the United States I itself. The, the Chinese have recently been seeking a way to try and see off that risk. I think American policymakers are somewhat wary that that Chinese policymakers are only doing this because of short-term considerations in China, because the market's down right now, the economy's facing headwinds. And so I think US policymakers, or at least some of them, are worried that China is just doing this as a matter of expedience without a real intention to find a comprehensive and long-lasting workable solution to the problem that, that we've got. Um, I, I hope that they will be able to find a, a way through that, both because I think that the consequences of delisting would be very damaging to both countries, uh, and also really as, as a symbol of whether or not they are able, notwithstanding all of the difficulties they're facing right now, geopolitically and otherwise, a symbol of whether or not they're able to find room to cooperate on areas which ultimately are of mutual interest. Okay, and now we have time for questions. Please, re please be reminded that all of these questions are um, on the record and we have a couple of microphones um, here and please introduce yourself before your question. So, okay, so the first I saw a gentleman over there. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. Hi, I'm James from Digfin. Uh, you mentioned in your remarks, uh, Mr. Falk, you talked about the imbalances, the inequalities in both China and the U.S. as playing a big role in um, their imbalances at the global level, the aggregates. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, what you see in terms of the, the role that social inequality and rising gaps between the rich and the poor in both of those countries are uh, impacting their relations with one another, and if you have any um, outlook, positive or negative, on where that's going to go. Thank you. Uh, James, th thanks for that question. The, um, it, it's, it's very difficult to draw a straight line between what's happening between the two countries and the, the individual issues that, that they've got and the wealth and income inequalities that are rising in both countries. But ultimately, what, what you've got is that many people in both countries are facing severe livelihood issues. In the US, it, it, it's much more acute because less, on, in the last 40 years, China, or most people in China, have experienced an increase in the standard of living, a significant increase in the standard of living. But in the United States, if you look at it, many young people now face the prospects of having a lower standard of living than their parents. Many young people face reduced opportunities, whether in terms of education or in terms of employment and so forth. And many people in the US face real hardship. Now, the, the reasons why those have, the reason why that's come about, or the reasons why that's come about are very complicated. You know, the, it's very easy to blame outsourcing of, of production to lower cost centers like China, but the fact is that at least half of the jobs that have been given up have been given up to industrial automation uh, and other factors. Now, you've also had in the United States a big shift since the 1980s towards real free market ideology where you've had reduced tax rates of taxation particularly on the wealthy and particularly on income sources derived from capital. And so through policies which have been enacted there, you've seen the, the rise in inequality. And many people don't, it's very difficult for most people to understand what, what's happened. It's very difficult, even if, you, if you've studied it very hard to understand everything that's contributed to all of that. But ultimately, what, it, what has happened is that people have become very angry. 
and they're looking for answers. And unfortunately, what you've seen, not just in the United States, but in China as well, you've had a tendency for policymakers and politicians to answer those questions with the very facile rhetoric of populist nationalism, whereby they blame the problems on other countries. And that has contributed to a level of animosity that you've seen between the two countries in that way. Now, China's in a slightly different position in that it, most people in China have experienced a significant rise in the standard of living over the last 40 years, but you are now seeing uh, you're, you're now seeing levels of wealth and income inequality which are comparable with or even above those in the United States and China. The, the fact of China's reform and opening up and all the economic and market mechanisms that they've espoused, it's allowed divides to open up. And particularly with the very rapidly aging population in China, what, what you're likely to see is a very precipitous de decline in the, the standard of living for some people if they are not able to maintain the, the level of economic growth that they've got, particularly now that they've got levels of debt that they've got in the system. And so increasingly, you're, you're seeing also that China, there, there are these problems to answer. And there, there's not really been a, a full and thorough uh, accounting of the issues and understanding of the issues. It's not as an acute, uh, it's not as acute a problem as in the United States right now, but you can very much see China going down the same route of uh, an increase in populist nationalism as a result. Okay, and then a uh, gentleman in the front. Thank you. Uh, Mark Michelson, IMA Asia. Thanks very much for that, particularly encouraged by movement toward liberalization of the RMB and maybe toward full convertibility. I, I hope it does happen. But I want to ask about Hong Kong. Uh, just soon after the FCC moved into this building, uh, the Hong Kong government decided to temporarily link the, U, the Hong Kong dollar, the US dollar. And now, almost 40 years later, it's still there, but it's again come up in the, in the news, partly, I think, as, as a collateral damage from the financial Cold War. What are your views about, about the link and how it should go forward and how it's affected by everything you've described today? Well, the, the peg has been extraordinarily useful in, in many ways because it, it's, it's given a huge amount of confidence to investors in the, the capital markets in Hong Kong. But I mean, there is, of course, a huge cost to that. The, the cost of that is that periodically the Hong Kong economic cycle is going to diverge significantly from the, the US economic cycle, and you, you're going to have inappropriate monetary policy in place in Hong Kong uh, as a result uh, over the past, or at least since the, the, end of the end of the global financial crisis in 2008, what, what we've seen is that you know, Hong Kong has had China levels of growth and it's had US levels of interest rates and it's caused or it's driven massive asset price increases, whether it's in real estate or, or other types of assets. We, we've seen the, the cost to that in terms of you know, the, the livelihood issues that it's created for many Hong Kong people. Now we, we see an environment in which the, the US and Chinese monetary policies are going in another diversion direction with US interest rates going up and the Chinese economy facing, and the Hong Kong economy facing significant headwinds, it's quite possible that we go back to something that we haven't seen since around the time of SARS, when you had interest rates in Hong Kong that were far too high, given the, the stage of the economic cycle that we're in. And uh, I'm sure everyone who was here at that time re remembers the, the incredible amount of pain it experienced in Hong Kong uh, as a result. 
I think it would be in the long run desirable for Hong Kong to pursue a different monetary policy and perhaps to move to a basket peg system whereby it can more closely align its monetary policy with its major trading partners and at least the level of economic misalignment with monetary policy won't be as acute as it has been and might become again with, with the US dollar. But you've also got to recognize that at this juncture, given everything that's happened over the last several years in Hong Kong, there's no denying the fact that there has been a level of loss of confidence amongst the international business and financial community in Hong Kong. Is this the right point in time, given that backdrop, to make such a big move? I, I'm not so sure. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have any questions from the I think there's a lady the back of the room? Oh, no, because I, I can't see. All right. Okay. If not, yes, lady over I'm Gigi from Mexico. Thank you so much, James. I pretty much agree with the most of your view just mentioned. Um, I also have a follow-up question regarding the polarized worsening relationship between China and US. Um, also, along with the rising nationalism just mentioned. Um, well, you said, well, China has developed so fast, but that was, well, my view was because, um, mostly because of the time of Deng Xiaoping. So uh, the government was pushing the market opening and also the liberalization of the Chinese market. And now since a few years, obviously with the change of political power, and we have seen um, the policy has shifted into a very different direction. And also, um, well, since Trump has been in power, and definitely the US and China relationship has worsened. And it has eased a little bit, but not that much. And uh, on the other side, um, well, China has, from the economic point of view, well, China has shifted from an uh, export-driven economy to a more domestic demand-driven economy. So basically, China has um, cared, let's say, less about the exports, and um, which also, along with the rising Jinmingbi, and uh, we have seen a lot of companies that have actually left China and moved to Southeast Asia, and, um, and also, we've seen like a lot of like a decrease in the foreign direct investments in China. And um, my question is, um, you know, um, with this macro backdrop, and obviously um, what I've spotted is Chinese government no longer cares or put um, the market, uh, like econom economic development as the top priority, but the rather more like um, commonwealth, achieving the commonwealth, crackdown of the big corporates and anti-corruption and also centralizing the most power. And um, as an investor professional, I'm pretty worried about that. And also, do you see this is, um, is gonna be become a major problem of Chinese economic development in the next few years? And that's the first question. Second one is uh, regarding uh, I, Hong I, Kong. Uh, I think we only have time for one question, so. Okay, yeah. I'm just asking that Thank you. In, this, in this environment, how would Hong Kong stand? Do you think Hong Kong is gonna lose the, the status as the offshore hub, um, you know, and also its competitive advantage versus Shanghai and also the Singapore? Thing. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, when you, look at, when you look at the shift that China's trying to make right now, it's one that is quite difficult to execute from a policy-making perspective because right up until several years after the, the global financial crisis, China's economic growth was very much driven by investment-led growth. And you're right that market forces helped in that. But the, the fact is that China's economy was being driven very much top down by investment. And clearly, it was very clear by the time President Xi came into power that 
that, that was driving a huge amount of capital misallocation. And so they've had to essentially shift towards placing a greater level of greater, greater level of reliance on consumption. And that, that's for, for an economy the size of China's, that's actually quite difficult, just making that kind of psychological shift. People have been used to making money out of you know, levering up, investing in real estate, etc., to a, an economy where people are going to have to do different things. Psychologically, on an individual level and across the system, that, that's going to be very difficult to, to do. And when you talked about you know, the issue of China making crackdowns on Chinese companies, I, I can see how that can certainly dent confidence amongst international investors because it, it seems a bit unclear what they're trying to achieve. I mean, my, my own interpretation uh, is that in China you've had in many areas of business, uh, many areas of its economy, the, the development has run way ahead of regulation. And th this is particularly true in the internet platforms where the, the two giants in there have been the leaders in Chinese payments and other sectors. And they, they've done extremely well. They've certainly driven growth. But also what, what you've seen more recently like in other parts of the world, the, these platform monopolies or oligopolies eventually tend to abuse that monopoly power to stifle competition. And I think where Chinese policymakers are on the face of it are concerned are that that is going to inhibit China's future economic growth potential, which is why they are intervening. Now you can certainly question the you can question the methods through which they intervene. The, the fact is that China's legal system is unlike that in the United States or in Western Europe, and the the government in many cases or, or government agencies are able to cut through a lot of the due process that would normally take place in other markets to go and deal with the issue. And I think, you know, in many ways, you know, perhaps sometimes that is foolish for Chinese government agencies to do that because it undermines confidence. It's entirely understandable what they're doing. And in fact, I mean, you know, the objectives in many cases are quite admirable. But the fact is that you know, you, you've got to think about the you, you've got to be, think about the wider system and perhaps the most expedient way of dealing with the problem. It can lead to a loss of confidence amongst the, the private entrepreneurs and private inv investors who have been increasingly important as a driver of economic growth and innovation in China. Okay, James Falk, thank you very, very much for being our speaker today. Maybe have a big round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Han thank you. and th thank you all. Thank you, and we won't let anyone leave from the FCC without a little gift oh, gosh. In, a, um, in a theme bag. And we also have our 40th year on Ice House Street version. We have a limited, edition, a limited number of this limited edition bag, which you can get uh, from the front desk. So thank you once again for coming, and thank you, everyone, for attending FCC uh, Lunch Talks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hanmeet. I will treasure it. <laughs>